Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar on Donor Egg 101. This webinar is brought to you by Resolve and sponsored by Shady Grove Fertility. We um, hope that this is really informative for you and um, a high-level overview of Donor Egg 101, but also gives you some valuable information to, um, to discuss and make decisions on and also to talk to your physician about. Advance the slide. So joining you today is myself. I'm Barb Kalora. I'm with Resolve, the National Infertility Association, and I will be your moderator. If you want to advance the slide. Our guest speaker and expert today is Dr. Gil Motla. Dr. Motla is a reproductive endocrinologist at Shady Grove Fertility. He um, practices in Annapolis, Maryland, and is also a wonderful advocate for our issues and has done a great deal of advocating both in the halls of Congress here in Washington, but also in the State House in Maryland. So Dr. Motla, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Barb, for the kind introduction. And for all those of you out there, we hope we add to what you know. We hope we stimulate conversation with your physicians about your medical care. Um, and let's try to add to what you know today. Wonderful, let's advance the slide. So we're here talking about donor egg. So Dr. Motla, give us an overview of what donor egg is and why somebody might need it. Essentially, donor egg is an alternative treatment for women who can't use their own eggs. The common denominator is in vitro fertilization, and that's the portion that the egg donor goes through. The patient as the recipient is has the embryo transferred to her, so she doesn't go through the ovarian stimulation and the egg retrieval and other things that are usually thought of as IVF. In donor egg, it's the donor's egg who is, again, stimulated, fertilized with partner's sperm, embryo developed, and ultimately transferred to the recipient. All right, Next let's slide. advance the slide because I know people always want to know who uses this and am I a good candidate? Essentially, women who can't achieve a pregnancy using their own eggs are the candidates to consider egg donation as an alternative. Um, advanced reproductive age, at age 40 or above, we know the eggs become genetically abnormal at a very high rate. Uh, with that comes miscarriage and risks of other chromosome issues. And if we use donor egg, we literally turn the hands of time back uh, 20 years for a woman who's, say, 40 if she uses a donor in her early 20s. Second category is something called premature ovarian failure. This can happen to a woman at any age, and essentially the ovaries stop working. Um, this is very frustrating, and again, it can happen at any age, and really the viable option is egg donation. There's another entity called poor egg quality, and you only learn that after typically doing multiple IVF cycles where we try different regimens, uh, different techniques, and in spite of what we do, we still get eggs that don't fertilize and don't grow. And lastly, removal of the ovaries for any medical reason, cancer, precancer, uh, or other conditions where we don't have eggs to work with, egg donation is a great alternative. And for single men or gay couples who need both egg donor and what's called the gestational carrier, someone carrying that pregnancy for them. Let me call your attention to the graph on the side here where we see miscarriages being very low in the young reproductive ages and rising very high into the early 40s, mid 40s. On the other graph, fertility we see is being very robust in the early 20s and falling uh, notably to age you know, 44, 45 or so. In egg donation, the eggs that we uh, we, that are donated are in that early part of the curve, so very low miscarriage rate, very low genetic abnormality rate, and robustly fertile. Excellent. Why don't we advance the slide? So this is these questions, Dr. Motla, we get here at Resolve all the time, and so I'd love for you to just walk through these for us, if you can. Sure. First question, again, we hope to resolve or hope we hope to address is, how do I need donor egg? And I think that's a great conversation to have with your physician reviewing your age, your medical history, and your past treatment. Um, will the treatment work? It's the most successful treatment we, we do, second to none, because 
we're operating on that low end of the reproductive lifespan, someplace typically in the 20s, and usually these very robustly fertile eggs become great embryos at very high pregnancy rates. And those success rates push into the 50 to 60 percent for a delivered baby quite easily. How long does the process take for people who have been through a lot of treatment and waited and so on? This is roughly a three to six month timeline. And three months on the inside, if somebody has done a lot of imaging and past care, uh, things that we can use and apply, or about six months if someone just comes in as a new patient. Is it hard to select an egg donor? I don't think it is. I think there are a number of ways to do this, and we'll talk about that more, but there are some very good agencies and egg banks that I think make donor uh, egg selection quite easy, uh, including most profiles that are ranged to be about 20 pages of data, uh, ethnicity, height, weight, occupation, education, likes, aptitudes. Um, I think with all that information, selecting the donor for most couples is, is pretty easy or certainly easier than many people would suspect. And how much information will you know? Likely a lot more than you suspect you will by that 20-page or equivalent document. And lastly, can I afford this? Uh, it is an expensive process. Uh, it's expensive for a number of reasons, uh, one of them being that this is regulated by our FDA, and the donors require quite a bit of testing, all for the right reasons, but that testing is expensive. There are plans that different practices offer, and we'll talk about this, where eggs are shared to reduce cost, and that can make treatment affordable for many couples. Well, that's excellent, and I know we're going to get into some of these in more detail, so let's jump into it. If we could advance the slide, tell us a little bit about these donor egg treatments, and I know we're going to go through each one of these and their own slides. So let me just um, mention this now, and then we'll, we'll advance the slide. So there's traditional, there's something called shared donor egg, which you've uh, alluded to, and then frozen eggs. So let's go jump right in um, and advance the slide and tell us in a little bit more detail what we mean by traditional or non-shared donor egg. So traditional is just that. It's non-shared. It's, it's the woman taking, the recipient woman taking all of the donor eggs as hers. Um, this can be done through a friend, a relative, a sister, uh, or an agency. But the point is that woman or that couple take all of the eggs. The advantage of this is that you increase the number of extra embryos we have to help somebody get pregnant, um, multiple tries, or potentially even achieve siblings, which is more common these days because success rates are high, embryos have a high pregnancy rate, and very often we'll have residual embryos that we'll use to achieve a sibling or sometimes even two. The downside or the con here is that it's more expensive. Recipients absorb the full cost of the screening that we talked about, regulated by the FDA, the donor's fee, uh, and all the testing. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is um, shared donor egg. Tell us about this. So shared donor egg is a process where we try to expand the number of eggs available to couples and essentially lower the cost. It's really a cost reduction strategy. When we look at young, robustly fertile women who may make 30 eggs, we don't need 30 eggs to help a couple. So if we share those eggs with another couple or even two other couples in a one to two or a one to three, we've made this treatment much, much more affordable. We've reduced the number of excess embryos, which for some couples may be a good thing if they desire just one pregnancy. But for a couple who wants two or three children, shared egg donation probably isn't the right fit. Um, the li the, lim the uh, con of this is really uh, not everybody does it. Uh, only sort of large practices or agencies that recruit donors of robustly fertile uh, capability do it. There's a risk of the cycle being canceled for the second recipient or maybe the third. And ultimately, there are fewer embryos achieved for each of the shared uh, individuals. Okay, and let's move the slide to the last option of, in terms of treatment type, frozen eggs. 
So frozen eggs, more recently we as a field have learned how to freeze eggs and thaw eggs really well. Uh, the quotable rate is 90% of these frozen eggs return to viability and about 80% of them fertilize well. So it's a really viable option. Um, the upside of this is that there's no waiting, there's no matching, and there's no synchronization. Um, frozen eggs also had the advantage for couples of different ethnicities to probably have more choice than any one agency or any one medical practice has for them. The downside is that not all centers are able to do this. Not all centers are able to recruit, freeze, and or thaw eggs. Pregnancy rates are a bit reduced as well. And in cycles, in comparing frozen eggs to fresh cycles, even in shared cycles, there are usually a few less eggs available for fertilization. Often egg lots are in five to eight in number, and with a good donor, uh, a couple may have more than that in terms of eggs available to them. But it definitely has a role, and for the right couple, uh, it can be the right treatment. Yeah, and you hear more and more about this in terms of um, frozen eggs. So it's, it is interesting to learn more about this option and potentially uh, the growth of this option for people considering donor egg. Let's um, move on to this slide because the next slide, because I want you to get in a little more detail about what the process um, entails and what people should expect. Sure. It really begins with an initial face-to-face -face consultation with your physician and, and typically your nurse. The evaluation includes some baseline blood testing, typically a sonogram to image the uterus, the pelvis, a practice embryo transfer to measure the uterus and to make sure there aren't anything like fibroid tumors or polyps within the uterus. We're looking for a completely normal uterine cavity and a semen analysis for the male partner. Once that piece is completed, we want to make sure that we can develop a good thick uterine lining and synchronize that in the fresh cycle. So we do a practice or called a mock medicated cycle. This is important because we learn really someone's individual physiology, how they respond to medications, and once we learn that piece, that's what we repeat in the real cycle. So this is, an, this is a, um, a, a rehearsal for the, the big night, if you will, for the opening night. Um, it's a dry run, it's a learning endeavor, and it's very important, and we credit that to some of the higher some of the highest success rates because we're able to develop the best lining in the real cycle. Selecting an egg donor, again, I think this is an easier process than most people would think going into it with all the information available. Synchronizing the egg donor and the recipient are tip, is typically done using birth control pills and aligning the cycles and often that takes a month or so to do. At that point, the donor goes forward with developing the eggs, the egg retrieval, fertilization uh, of the eggs from the male partner, growth of the embryo, typically over five days, and at the end of that, a blastocyst or a day 500 cell embryo is typically transferred. And many times, this is a single transfer as recommended, so we're eliminating the issues of risk of twins, and we're producing a high pregnancy rate as well. All right, excellent. Let's go to the next slide. I know you've talked already about um, choosing an egg donor, and I think I just want to highlight some of these questions for people to keep in mind um, when choosing their egg donor. Um, there's there's uh, questions about anonymity um, regarding would you like to speak with that donor? Um, would you feel more comfortable um, matching possibly with somebody that you already know, meaning somebody who might be a friend or a friend of a friend or a family member, and then um, what you know what your donor might need or, or want in terms of, um, of of just the process, but also you want you will really want to think about um, how you're going to approach this. Um, you know, talking to your partner. I would talk to the physician, Dr. Motley. I think um, you might have some some good advice to give to folks that are thinking about this. But is there anything else that you think that people should keep in mind when they're choosing an egg donor? Well, I think very early in the process, before somebody even gets to this process, the sort of psychologic uh, consultation with a professional is very important. I think that helps pull out uh, feelings that both partners may have. I think it makes a plan for 
Uh, do you t to choose to tell friends or family or this child? Uh, how do you do it? What's age appropriate? The general feeling is that secrets are probably inherently bad, and honest, loving disclosure about how this child came to be is probably a good thing. So when you're choosing a donor, uh, I think it becomes very personal to couples. And most couples tend to be more comfortable in an anonymous situation when they're using an agency or a donor recruited through a medical practice. Some people find it very important to be able to identify that donor, possibly speak with her, or possibly even keep in touch with her. There's less opportunity to do that than the anonymous donors. Many of the donors themselves feel perfectly comfortable being anonymous, uh, but some shy away from uh, contact. Not all, but some. Um, other people find it very important to match with somebody donating that they already know, be it a relative, possibly a sister, or possibly a good friend. And that's a unique situation. Uh, it's very special when it works. Often uh, there are issues between the, the individuals or the spouses. Uh, so everybody who goes into it with that, not everybody finishes off with a known situation. Uh, and when matching with the donor, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that nobody is perfect medically or psychologically um, and that you typically won't find somebody who's absolutely perfect. Um, donors are screened medically, genetically, and psychologically, and we have that 20-page equivalent document. But again, some flexibility in choosing, I think, gives people more choice, and that's important. Great. Well, let's go on to some of the statistics surrounding egg donation. Okay. Uh, these statistics are a bit old, um, but out of nearly 9,000 cycles, the success rate in terms of a delivered baby is roughly 50%, 49.6 here. Uh, frozen cycles, there are less of them because there are less practices freezing eggs, and it's more common to do it in a fresh synchronized cycle. Uh, so out of 2,200 cycles, that success rate is still quite high at 43%, remembering that our human success rate is probably 20 to 25% at best for non-infertile couples of uh, optimal reproductive age. So both these options are significantly higher than normal, and, and you know we're pleased to share that information. All right, let's go to the next slide. I know we've covered a lot of this already in terms of who might be egg donors and the screening that's involved and, and so forth. But I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Motla, um, you know, you've got some age ranges on here and that sort of thing. Um, is that pretty consistent with what you see in terms of um, the donors that you work with? I think so. I mean, we're looking for ages typically in the mid 20s as maybe being optimal, but they're very uh there's some very fertile women in their early 30s. Um the egg donation really can't be done properly under age 21 according to the guidelines of our society. We want uh, mature women who can give truly informed consent to be doing this. Um many of the women who do this have a medical background of some sort. They have a, a aspect of altruism to their personalities. They may volunteer. They may give blood. Um, some of them may be young moms who've completed their own childbearing and realize uh, they can donate and make this very special gift to people. So they're, they're typically a very special group of, of young women. All right. I know um, this is the big question. If you want to advance the slide. You've touched on it a little bit when you were talking about shared egg cycles and how that's really a cost reduction strategy, but let's talk about what the costs are and um, if you could walk through each of these and if you have um, some ideas on ranges, but you know, these are really the components when you break down a donor egg cycle, um, and maybe you can talk about each one of these. Sure. Um, it starts, like, again, the costs start out really with screening the egg donor to see if she's in fact a good candidate to do this. And that screening is medical, it's physician face to face evaluation, it's a sonogram, it's genetic screening typically. Um, many practices screen over 100 different carrier diseases to make sure the donor doesn't carry that. And there's a psychologic interface, too, with a psychologic professional to make sure the donor is comfortable doing this, uh, make sure she's committed to doing this. 
And when you finish all that screening, it really adds up cost. Typically, donors can be compensated anywhere between zero and probably $10,000, depending on the practice and the situation. There are practice uh, guidelines for this. We're trying to compensate donors for their time, their trouble, their lost wages, their inconvenience, uh, their time away from work, uh, given the surgery involved in the retrieval process. Um, and, and that's the goal between compensation. It's really to compensate them for what they've lost. Unfortunately, the medications for fertility treatments are expensive as well. And although the donors don't use much of these, you know, these can push into $1,000 to $2 pretty easily. Then you have the cost of in vitro or IVF. And most situations are used, uh, used ICSI, which is, stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where one sperm from the male partner is injected into the egg to maximize fertilization. And we want to be able to freeze any extra embryos uh, the couple has. So when you total that up, that cost can be quite high, you know, somewhere near $25,000, as the slide says. But in a shared egg donation cycle, that cost can be significantly lower. Um, there are many programs that offer multiple cycles of IVF care for not much more than one cycle here at 25000 So well, let's it, actually... it is... Yeah, go ahead. I'm saying I, I want to give the impression that not all cycles cost $25,000. It's the shared program that really makes this much more affordable for a lot of couples. Well, and that's exactly it. Let's move to the next slide because we're getting right into cost, and um, you're you're already jumping on it here, helping people figure out ways to um, figure out how to pay for this, right, um, since it's sure. not going to be covered by insurance. You've mentioned the shared practices. Um, you know, there's, I think, packages and guarantees. There's financing programs. The packages and guarantees are going to be programs provided by your practice. So if that's not something that um, you can find on their website, please ask your physician, ask the nurse, ask the finance folks, Do uh, does that practice have any um, offerings that would help you in covering this cost? Um, you know, Dr. Motla, what I always say to patients is, please, please ask. Don't assume that, you know, you've received a flyer on this or you found it on the website um, because once you ask what options there might be available, um, I think that, you know, every practice is going to be able to sit down with that patient, talk about here's what to expect in terms of the cost and here's what options our practice has in order for you to help pay for it and potentially even lower the cost. I think, um, you know, that's probably your experience as well in terms of helping patients navigate this piece of the of really their treatment puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I'd also add that, you know, most egg donors, no matter what practice or what agency that they're affiliated with, are pretty much the same. They're healthy young women. So the differences between medical practices really are the experience and the volume of egg donation that they do and the teams they have in place to do this well, and the financial packages that they offer. Um, I think the key word would be compare. Do your research because things vary greatly between medical practices. Okay, great advice. All right, let's go to the next slide. You've mentioned this a little bit, and this is something that we run into a lot at Resolve as people are contemplating egg donation and things like disclosure. And, um, you know, what's your advice here in terms of, you know, you've got a patient that wants to be a recipient of, of egg donation, um, but they haven't really thought about how they're going to talk about this. You know, it's one thing to announce your pregnancy. It's another to say, oh, I'm pregnant through egg donation. So tell us a little bit about the practicalities of this and, and what your advice is for your patients. Sure. My my advice is really to start with the psychological professional's consultation. We, we politely mandate people do this um, uh, as a standard of care. We want people to explore their feelings and talk through it and have a plan when this baby comes to be because the chances of being successful are incredibly high. So I recommend couples have that psychological consultation first and talk through the issues, uh, how they feel about it, what they would tell or not tell, what a plan would be to tell a child, and what's age appropriate. And there are a lot of resources on this these days uh, in terms of books written and so on. If the couple is comfortable with that piece of it, 
then the medical piece falls into place pretty easily. Well, I think uh, I think that's great advice. All right, um, we had um, a few questions come in through our community, through the Resolve community. Okay. Um, we've, of course, have have answered quite a bit of questions that came through here today. But something you've sort of alluded to that um, was a question that came through was: Does every, I mean, is it assumed, Dr. Motley, that every IVF center in the United States does uh, deals with egg donation? No, uh, I, I don't. I don't think that's the case. I think your larger centers will consistently offer egg donation, and smaller centers probably find it more difficult too, with less resources. Um, this is very detail-specific care too, and I think your larger centers tend to have teams that offer this that are very experienced, and smaller centers um, maybe not so much. Larger centers will also tend to offer. Uh, their own donors on a database, typically that are already screened. Um, so compared to somebody using, say, an agency where a donor may fail screening and incur cost in doing so, some of the larger practices, I think, have a cost savings uh, advantage too. Now, um, somebody has asked us about um, the frozen egg um, scenario. Are frozen eggs able to be mailed or shipped? you know, across the country, or does the patient need to go to uh, where those frozen eggs are stored? No, not at all. There are some very good egg banks around the country that do ship eggs to medical practices. Um, The key, though, is what's the experience of that medical practice with thawing? There are two components to success in in egg donation, specifically egg freezing, freezing the eggs properly and thawing them properly. And the more experience a practice has, the better results will will, will be uh, compiled. All right. Let's um, go to the last slide. I want to give everybody some additional resources. Um, please visit resolve.org. You can find all sorts of information on other family building options, support services, and ways to connect with our community. Please, if you have further questions on on this topic or others, you can always email Resolve at info at resolve.org. And again, um, Dr. Motla with Shady Girl Fertility, we are so um, happy you could join us. You provided some amazing information, really detailed, um, but also very comprehensive in terms of of the whole way to look at egg donation as a way to build your family. So I want to, first of all, thank Shady Girl Fertility for their sponsorship of Resolve and specifically for this webinar. And Dr. Motla, I want to thank you for your time and your service and your great advice that you've provided here today. Thank you, Barbara. I'll just end by saying, again, I hope we've added to what you know. Um, This isn't the right treatment for everybody, but I think it's a really exciting alternative for women and couples who don't have alternatives. Um, This is one cell that is donated and that you as the recipient are accepting. It's fertilized with partner sperm. Your body grows this embryo into a baby. Uh, and there may be you know, influences of your nutrition and your body and other factors that we can't quite quantitate that may influence that baby's growth and development in a positive way. So I think for all those reasons and others, it's an exciting treatment to look at and to see if it might be right for you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.